You've got a front yard garden. You've got eyes on the street. You are growing more food locally. You're less dependent on distant energy. That makes it more resilient. You're in the front yard. People stop. Oh, you've got a front yard garden. Works every time. I know so many people who have made friends and learned interesting things because they stopped because they're seeing somebody in their front yard with a garden. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. In the summer of 2006, we visited Eugene, Oregon, and there we taped my first permaculture show with Jan Spencer. It was about a backyard renewal that he had done to change his suburban house into a permaculture site. Jan's visiting us today at Lone Bobcat Woods, and thanks for coming. Well, it's great to be here, Jenea. I wanted to find out in these, what, almost four years since, kind of where you've gone, because you're You've got your wonderful suburban backyard, and it's like you haven't stopped there. You're spanning your efforts. So tell us what you've been up to. Well, it's, a, it's an entire suburban property, the whole quarter acre. Uh, as you remember, having sat on the top of that, the urbanite with that little water feature that I had. That's right, the, the, the driveway you broke up That's and right. turned into your fountain. What we have right here is a little decorative structure. <laughs> And that's oh, my driveway upside down. Well, it's also, what I see here is a pond. That's a water you know? feature, yeah. So you've, really... you've, you've, you've made your pond from your, from your, and the bed, the raised bed, using this as your, as your protection, as your, exactly that. your wall. So since then, moved into the bungalow. Yeah. The bungalow we took a look at at that time. Right. It's my residence now. Um, another... Uh, several items I've started doing is there's a carport that was converted into a living space. It has a flat roof. And last year, for the first time, I started cultivating up there on that flat roof. So you got a rooftop garden. There's room for improvement. <laughs> Great ideas don't happen perfect every time. I need to get my stuff up there earlier in the season. But I have visions of that being a, a place for winter squash with the tendrils, you know, the vines growing all over the place because it's one of the sunniest places on the property. And then another big project that's going to take a number of years to kind of manifest is, you may remember along my west fence line there was a big hedge, a big laurel hedge. That's all gone now. Last summer my neighbor and I took that out. We hooked up, you know, chain, his old Chevy Suburban, and yanked those out in a collaboration because he didn't want them there either. So that makes available about 60 feet long and about five feet wide that I'm, I'm going to be turning into a food forest along there. Fine. Some new fruit Fine. trees and then, you know, the multi-layer food forest. So that's kind of something new is this uh, food forest approach. And then another item that's new is um, just a few months ago, I installed a 3,000 gallon water tank, hooked that up to the bungalow. So that puts me at about six and a half thousand gallons of rainwater storage. Fabulous, fabulous. And what that means is that, that takes care of my outdoor garden, agriculture, water needs for the summer. Fabulous. Yeah, Ooh. I'm off the Ooh. grid for water for Yay. outside. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, Good and it's work. exciting, and it's filled up already, too. You're, you're set. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Big polyethylene tank, eight feet in uh, yeah. diameter yeah. and eight feet high. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to expand you past your changes on your site. You said you're moving your activism sort of onto the neighborhood level, is that right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that, because you're excited. Sure. This is a wonderful potential, a little bit of those potentials starting to happen. I've been on the board of my neighborhood association for 10 years, and let me just explain briefly what a neighborhood association is. In Eugene, the city has a neighborhood program 
where there's actually some city budget and three city staff take care of the neighborhood associations with technical assistance, with different kinds of training. There's a little bit of budget, you know, for newsletters and communication. And it's only been within the last, say, three or four years, I've begun to appreciate how a totally mainstream neighborhood program can be used as a, a way to advocate green living and permaculture and alternative economics and, and the kinds of things that many of us are really interested in. That's in the early going of actually happening in Eugene. What is the, what is the Neighborhood Association, what, what is it for? I mean, what is the county doing, uh, the city doing with that? Yeah, essentially, the program is to empower people where they live in their neighborhoods. See, we have 19 different neighborhood associations in Eugene. Other cities do this in their own variations, but essentially it's to encourage people at the neighborhood level to be proactive and, and look after the important issues in their neighborhood. It could be stormwater, it could be development, it could be traffic, it could be various types of interactions, relations with the city. But it's only in the last couple of years where we've started to graft environmental grassroots eco-activism onto that. Tell me, what are you doing? I mean, what kinds of things are you eco-green living? Give me some specifics. Yeah. For example, in October, I organized uh, a meeting for our organization, River Road Community Organization. That's my neighborhood. We have a board, we have monthly meetings, some of the meetings are just about business, but four or five times a year, we put on a program for the neighborhood that would have neighborhood interest. So I said we should have a program about creating a more resilient neighborhood. And of course, we have a board that's very cooperative and, and positive and all eco-oriented. Great. So there was no need to explain very much of that. So what we did is, is made a plan to have something of a panel discussion that would bring together explanations of several existing programs that many communities have. This is what's exciting, because it's not just Eugene that can replicate this. There's most cities have a neighborhood watch program. Which, most is, which is what? Tell neighborhood what watch, usually administered by the police department. Neighborhood watch has those kind of funny signs with the eye and says we're, we have a neighborhood watch, so be on good behavior because we're kind of watching. And so, that means your neighbors are watching out for un, unexpected activity yeah, and keeping they're an eye looking on each out other's for each houses other's. and so on, like yeah. when they're off at work or where else. Yeah, exactly. Off for vacation, okay. uh, a moving van pulls up. I didn't know they were moving. So it's to look after each other's well-being and property. Okay. And not every neighborhood has this, but almost all cities have a program. And it's very much neighborhood centric. It's up to people in their neighborhoods to make use mm -hmm. of this kind of a program. So usually there are employees who can explain how to make this work, you know, a little technical assistance. Yeah. So when we had this, um, this program in October, we invited a person from Neighborhood Watch. We also invited a person who uh, is responsible, the manager in Eugene, for emergency preparedness. Because emergency preparedness, generally, that refers to a flood, an earthquake, a typhoon, fire. Different places have different threats. But any town has some kind of an emergency preparedness. What happens when the lights go out? And Eugene has that, too. So what we did is have representatives from Neighborhood Watch, Emergency Preparedness, Permaculture, and I also kind of covered our neighborhood program. All four of these entities have an interest in community well-being and safety, but yeah. they just kind of approach it in a slightly different ways with a different focus. But all of them totally have a common denominator, and that is we're interested in a safe and, and secure community. So what the permaculture adding to that is, a safe 
secure and greener community mm. because we know a greener community is safer and more secure. So we did this meeting and the, the first action that can be taken that satisfies the agenda of all of those entities is, of course, putting a garden in a front yard. You've got a front yard garden, you've got eyes on the street, you are growing more food locally, you're less dependent on distant energy, that makes it more resilient, you're in the front yard, people stop, oh, you've got a front yard garden. Works every time. I know so many people who have made friends and learned interesting things because they stopped because they're seeing somebody in their front yard with a garden. Interesting. So you're, you've got your emergency preparedness too, because if you've got more of your own food, whether you store it then or you've got it out there, if the lights go out, you know you've got some food. Is that the thinking? That's absolutely. That That's and then of course it doesn't stop at a garden. Is this? whole idea evolves and you're out front gardening and somebody stops and says, oh, you've got a front yard garden. Oh, yeah, and that's not all. Come around back and I'll show you my water collection system. Come around back you know, and I'll show you my passive solar design. Or I can tell you if you need some help in taking your grass out, here's the telephone number of a group in town, Victory Gardens, that can help you take your grass out. Yeah. So these are, and this is just the beginning. I mean, what it's, it's educational, but you're also finding out your neighbor's interest, and I would hope that you, over time you'll find out who has what skills, because this person might be a carpenter or... Absolutely. That That's the logical direction that this would go in. And then when, and this is kind of getting into the more theoretical realm, okay. but say, for example, there's a... Uh, you've, churches, communities of faith all over the place, when there becomes enough interest and demand for this stuff, essentially churches, communities of faith, they all have places to meet, they got classrooms. Uh, how about when those kinds of places become neighborhood community centers and say this is in our neighborhood's best interest, we will make space available for there to be workshops about permaculture, about food preservation, about different kinds of reskilling. So, and then say, for example, that church hosts a scout troop. So, okay, let's put the scouts to work. Maybe they can become the neighborhood assistants for helping to take out grass and put in gardens. I wow. think there's even a gardening merit badge. So, to, so the, the whole point being to take these existing entities that are, that are mainstream and kind of tweak them a bit and turn them into a vehicle for greening our communities. And, and we're in the early stages because now in Eugene, the, the director of emergency preparedness knows about this. Great. The fellow in Eugene who does this training called CERT training, Community Emergency Response Team, that's kind of like local citizens learn the basics of emergency preparedness. So it's great. to move forward with this is it's a great idea and to make more of this happen, of course, is what the, is what's called for. But almost any town has these elements, whether they have a permaculture group or a gardening group. And, and it's really a big plus to have a neighborhood organization because a neighborhood organization can take this on and be more a part of letting people know. Because when we had our meeting on resilient neighborhoods, there was a postcard that went out to every address in our neighborhood. So not everybody shows up, but they, thousands of people saw that postcard and it starts getting people thinking about this. So stuff. you're partly using it as an education, part of the awakening, and part of it is see who who's starts to get interested and starts to make it happen. How many people did you have you know, show up at your workshop? Uh, the, the meeting drew over 100 people, Fabulous. which is more than average. And, and I could guarantee you a lot of these people have never heard of permaculture. But I had some friends come to the meeting, seed saving, and uh, the digging up, you know, the front yards. I asked people in those kind of activities to show up because I could call on them. And yeah. you can bet there are a lot of people there who never heard of, of the idea of saving seeds this way. Yeah. And uh, Andrew, I called on him and he talked for several minutes 
on seed saving and how that's part of a more resilient neighborhood when we don't have to go to the store to buy seeds. Right, right. That's exciting. It is. But there needs to be ongoing movement. It's, it's one thing to come up with all these great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's another to actually see them happen. Actually, that's true with anybody organizing anything. Yeah. You know that. It's like it takes a while to get it with real feet, with real people happening. But it seems to me that what you're doing is the first spade work on doing that at the neighborhood level yeah. where you are. Yeah. And it's making use of pre-existing yeah. programs that Neighborhood Watch wasn't created to advocate permaculture. But now, Margaret... Uh, and Todd, who are, are these police department employees, are not actually policemen, but they go out and talk about Neighborhood Watch. They've agreed to take the brochure that we have yeah. and hand that out and make that known along with their other information, saying, oh, here's something of interest. Uh, consider turning your front yard into a garden. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears for a little bit here. You've also been... Um, expanding your activism by taking a look at what other communities up in the Pacific Northwest are doing towards resilience. So I wondered if you could give us sort of a, an observer's report. What are you hearing about? What are you seeing elsewhere? Uh, in the last month or two, I have spent a little time in Olympia, primarily Olympia and Bellingham okay. in Washington State, both located along Puget Sound. And there's, there's permaculture interest there, there's transition town interest, and I saw a little bit of that. Uh, I did presentations in both of those locations. We took a bike tour uh, in one in Olympia. We did a bike tour. There's more of this kind of property conversion going on in mm -hmm. Olympia mm -hmm. than there used to be. Mm -hmm. And then in Bellingham, there's also more. You can go into kind of the older neighborhoods of Bellingham small properties, but, but here and there you see small front yards turned into gardens. And I met uh, one woman uh, named Chris, and she's also tuned into using neighborhood associations as something like this mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. So that provides her with a little bit of a platform because she's on the board of her neighborhood association. So she can knock on a door and say, hi, I'm Chris. And I'm uh, on the, uh, the York neighborhood board, and this is a little subgroup we have that's interested in, in front yard gardens. So she's actually made a lot of friends mm -hmm. in her neighborhood. We went out and walked around and said, oh, hi, yeah, hi, Sue. You know, she knows a lot of people. And they have work parties in their neighborhood to help people put in front yard gardens. So, of course, that accomplishes a lot of tasks. Right. And in our walk around, I probably saw a half dozen front yard gardens just in a fairly small area. Mm -hmm. But the, the common denominator of all that is people taking time to take yeah. the time yeah. to do this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because it doesn't happen by itself. No, I, you, have to, you have to have that extra push past your own busy life to being able to connect with other people. Yeah, and another thing that's happening, I think it happened last week, in Bellingham is they have a, a, a pretty effective transition town group there and they had this event over the weekend called the Great Unleashing and that's kind of taking things up to a little bit of a of a more community-wide level they I didn't go but they did this at a local high school and it was on two days and the whole idea is to bring people together who have interest in these various aspects of, of a more ecological and a more resilient community and get those people together not to create a central control because of course that's never going to happen right. but to get people who are working on local food or energy or green building or front yard gardens or neighborhoods to get these people who are already in these realms to be aware of others and even for the others to be aware these things are happening even though even though that's not their focus they can still be aware, and then by and by, oh, that's right. I know Chris is doing that stuff in York neighborhood. I think I'll give her a call, and maybe we yeah. can collaborate. It's sort of creating the opportunity for those acquaintances that will evolve over time into the stronger relations and, and collaborations. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's essential. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's community building. It's community building. What are you seeing down in Olympia? Olympia, uh, one of the most interesting things, um, the city of Olympia is welcoming to people who identify places around town that are city property and really aren't being used for much. Like one place we visited was kind of a right of way. There was, could have been a street through here, right. but instead there was no street and there's just a house, city right of way, which was all green and then another house, but there was no street. I've seen this a couple places in Olympia. Right. And the woman who was explaining it to us was saying, she went to the city and uh, the city actually is welcoming of that, more so. Welcoming I, what, using that land for? Uh, welcoming of people in town taking this kind of initiative. To, to do what with that land? To come though? to the city and say, I know there's okay. some city property, okay. how about we put some garden on okay. there, and make a little bark path and make a trellis mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. kind of a nice little green space that, that's interesting okay. and functional and helpful and nice. shows life. Nice, nice. So the city's, uh, that's seeming to be okay with doing that. They may say, we may put a road there someday, and if you keep, if you want to do this, just understand that that may happen. That's but uh, personally, I'm hoping we've reached peak road building. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like to be peak road building. Jan, in our last five, five minutes here, I want to make sure you cover what else I haven't asked you about. What else you've seen or that intrigues you, inspires you? Yeah. I just see that there's conversations that need to be that need to be a part of the public discussion that really, to my satisfaction, aren't happening. And that's a conversation about not tweaking the system, because I don't think the system is tweakable. I'm thinking more a holistic analysis of so many of the issues we face about the environment, global relations, peak oil, climate change, the economy. They have a common source that gives rise to these challenges and these problems, and that is our economic system. Mm. And when we address changing or even better, replacing that economic system, replacing market capitalism with a green economy that has a whole different set of goals and values and ideals, that's what, that's what this bit of a, of a road show is about, mm -hmm. is this more holistic approach. When we approach the issue of the, the economic system and we start to make changes and repair that, then we start addressing all these issues, these other issues, all at the same time. When you say green economy as opposed to a market economy, there are a lot of people who are trying to green the market economy. What do you mean instead? I mean to redefine what our economy's goal is, a mission statement for our economy. And what would you have that be? I would say that that would be that it would exist and what it, what it required to function would fit within what planet Earth can sustain. Ah, a and sustainable then, economy. Yeah, and then another big part of it would be, this is more of a cultural, social part, that there would be an understanding that kind of our civilization, our economy, our way of life, one of its main ideals and goals is to bring the best out in the people who live in it, to create citizens rather than consumers. Mm -hmm. So those are two main things. It would be ecologically responsible and it would be socially and culturally responsible because I feel like people have enormous positive potentials, but we live in a distraction make-believe economy and it is not bringing out the best in people, I don't think. Well, people are very, very busy trying to, do, to, to survive in a market economy, a, you know, of money, a money economy. Of course. And what I hear, you, you know, your neighborhood association or your front yard garden aren't part of the market economy. They're part of a home or a economy. And these little tidbits in Olympia and Bellingham and Chico and some in Dave and all over the place, you've seen, you yeah, and Robin yeah. have been to these places. Okay. These are the small beginnings of as they grow and mature and evolve and expand. These are the real life beginnings of ideally an alternative green based economy and way of life. We're talking about redefining our own values and yeah. redefining our own value of ourselves because we are human potential, I think is our greatest renewable resource. 
Oh, I like that. Sure, because I'm seeing that people's creativity or people's activism, like your own, um, seems to be unlimited. It is. And um, it's taking the time to do it. And as the economic system does this, more people will find time. And if they know about permaculture, they know about these peak moment kinds of ideas, the better the chances are for making a transition into something that's healthy and affirming. That's our challenge. That's the goal. What I, what I hear from you here in our last minute is you're finding, you're doing some of that. You're finding other people that are planting seeds for that because it really is just the beginnings of that kind of shift, it would seem to me, towards people being more um, self sufficient or sharing with each other mm. cooperating with each other instead of being separate consumers yeah it's a redefining who we are and it's a redefining our values instead of having corporate america mm. defining what our values are and having people essentially the servants of the economy how about if the economy was serving our culture's uplifted goals and ideals that's yes. Kind of a nice idea. <laughs> Turn it around. Yeah. In our last 25 seconds, tell me, tell us, tell us what you've got here. Oh, this is a DVD that I made, and this covers a number of topics. Give me the title. It's Global Trends, Local Choices. Okay. I I made it myself with a little technical help, but it it touches on economics, a number of fascinating examples why this economy is not a companion for the world we want to see. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bit about power shift, meaning taking the time, downsizing, localizing. A part of it is about urban renewal, mm -hmm. changing mm -hmm. at the home level, the block level, the neighborhood level. Then there's part of it about neighborhoods. I mentioned this resilient neighborhood idea. There's more of that. And where's your website? And the website is suburbanpermaculture.org. And this can be found on my website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing everything that you're doing. Yeah, and thanks well, for taking it beyond your own backyard. Yeah, well, I appreciate what you two are doing, and I appreciate what a lot of people are doing. Yeah. yeah and to doing. realize there's others working on this, too, all over the place. That's exciting. But there's a lot of work yeah, to do. There is. You're watching Peak Moment, locally reliant living for challenging times. I'm Janae Donaldson. My guest is Jan Spencer from Eugene, Oregon. Join us next time.